I'm Aaron Ironside, spokesperson for Say Nope to Dope. We've been drawing some great resources and information and data about what's happened in jurisdictions that have legalized cannabis, and particularly in the US and Canada. And we've done that because I think most Kiwis understand that the US and Canada is fairly close to us. We're, we're Western cultures, and of course, perhaps most importantly, those jurisdictions have legalized in more recent times. So we can see some of the effects that have happened post-legalization in countries fairly similar to us. Dr. Kevin Sabet is the head of Smart Approaches to Marijuana, Sam, and he joins me today. Hi, Kevin. Hi, how are you, Aaron? I'm doing well, and we're very grateful uh, for your help today to continue to better understand what is a very complex set of issues, because it seems that we're having multiple conversations at once. Yeah. Conversations around whether people should be locked up for smoking a joint. There's conversations right. about the benefits of marijuana as a medical product, and there's yeah. conversations about a commercialized market. Of those issues, is one of them more important than the others? Yeah, I mean, look, they're all important issues, but I think commercial marijuana legalization is very important. It's the most important because it's about creating a massive new industry that basically relies on addiction for profit. So if you look at any other addictive industry, they rely on the really 10% of its users uh, pay for 80% of um, you know the revenues uh, for the, that business, like alcohol or tobacco, for example. And what that means is that these businesses rely on hooking people and they don't want casual users. They don't want the one-off user. They want regular users. And I'm worried that um, you know we're creating basically another tobacco industry right under our nose. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to me to be per, you know basically closing the door on tobacco and talking about all the harms while at the same time rolling the red carpet out for cannabis. Well, we've chosen to be an evidence-based campaign, but to be honest, that has meant that a lot of people have often accused us of fake news, which is yeah. of course, the easy thing to say anytime you disagree in our current environment. However, yeah. I can see why some people are confused. I have seen from the same jurisdictions studies that say there's been a minimal increase in use post-legalization yeah. and other studies from that same country saying there's been a significant increase in use. Right. How do we work out who to believe? It's hard because there's a huge propaganda machine pushing the normalization of today's very high potent marijuana. Uh, and so it, it is hard to know that we rely on science. We rely on scientists themselves. We have a blue ribbon scientific advisory committee from Harvard and Yale and other top research institutions in the United States that guide everything that we do and everything that any of our affiliates do around the world or around the US. So um, for us, the, the science is most important. And it's true, most people don't realize uh, that today's marijuana is much more potent than it used to be, um, you know, and that it's causing a lot more problems than it ever did. Uh, a lot of people's experience with marijuana or cannabis is basically kind of you know, they tried it, they didn't really like it, they moved on with their life. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. It's like, uh, you know, someone who was speeding on a highway. They did it once, they didn't get into a car crash, so what's the problem, right? Everyone can do it. Well, the reality is, when you speed, um, you increase your risk of a car crash. And the same thing with marijuana. When you use it, you increase your risk of these problems, especially if you use it before you're age 25. And so, I just worry that they were creating another very hungry industry and they, they, are, they are obscuring the statistics. They are obscuring the facts. Listen, we're never saying that marijuana is a demon drug and that its users should be locked up in prison and throw away the key and forget about it. This is the worst drug ever. No, it's not the worst drug ever and we wouldn't want to do that to anybody. However, it's much worse than people realize. And again, what we're talking about today is not what we were talking about 20 or 30 years ago. Well, let's address a couple of those things that I've heard, particularly from users. Two, two claims. Uh, one is that it's not addictive. People will look right. me in the face and say, I just don't believe it's addictive. And the other one that goes alongside of that is, I've never heard of anybody ODing from cannabis. So yeah. therefore, it's nowhere near as dangerous as other things. But what would you say right. to that? Well, nobody ODs from tobacco either, uh, from cigarettes. It's an extremely rare event. And so the idea that we're just concerned about ODs, to me, that doesn't make sense because nobody's dying from an overdose of smoking too many cigarettes, right? But we know it's a huge public health menace. Why are smoking cigarettes and alcohol the biggest public health menaces to society? Why, why is that? Well, it's not because they're more harmful than heroin. You know, It's not because they're more harmful than methamphetamine. 
it's because they're actually used far greater than are illegal drugs. And they're used far greater because they're legal. They're normalized, they're legal, they're available. And that's what goes into the harmfulness of the drug. It's not just the individual sort of biology of a substance. Uh, if that were the case, um, you know, we wouldn't have as many deaths or the cost to society from our legal drugs, but we do precisely because they are legal and available. Uh, talk to me about where laws go, because, for example, at the moment, if we bring up edibles in the debate, our yeah. current proposed law says that edibles won't be available from shops, and yet we can see that they're freely available, or not so free, but certainly widely available in the black market. Uh, yeah. Do laws change over time? Is something that's restricted today potentially become available tomorrow? Yeah, they do. Listen, if we could freeze the New Zealand law, uh, you know, throughout history, we might say, well, it's better than Canada and it's better than the U.S. It's reasonable. Uh, you know, you all are pretty reasonable people we hear up here. So, uh, yeah, you know, you came up with a reasonable law. OK, we can. We don't love it, but if it, we can live with it. The reality is over time, because of the pressure groups, because of the money that's into this, and frankly, because the government says, well, you know, the sky hasn't fallen, so let's expand it a little bit. And of course, the reality is consequences for marijuana are often felt 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road. Again, it's not like methamphetamine where it's always instant. Now, in some ways it is instant with driving, which we can talk about, or psychotic breaks, which we can talk about. But in many cases, this is something, a lot of parents call it a slow kill. Their, their child didn't die from meth or heroin overnight, but they had a slow kill over time. And so a lot of governments in the short term might to, to gain some political points and say, hey, we're gonna bring in more revenue and be more open, et cetera, that they're very likely to actually loosen the laws. And we're seeing that in many US states where something starts out very restrictive and then it gets very loose over time. We've seen that in Canada where they outlawed edibles and then they said, well, a year later, we're gonna allow edibles on a certain date. And now they do have edibles. So, and, and listen, Canadians are pretty sensible people too, but yet they, they are allowing that. So, you know, I think it's easy, um, especially as someone who's, you know, I, I'm married to someone who's not American. I lived abroad a lot of my life. I think it's very easy to say, Oh, well, you know, those, those are, we're never going to do it like those crazy Americans, you know, they're capitalism central, which is true. I mean, America is, and, and we tend to do a lot of the things in a very extreme, unhealthy way for, for the mighty dollar. Right. Um, but it's easy to sort of say, well, we're not going to do that. Don't worry. It's not like that. We're not going to be like Colorado where we're going to have gummies and candies and teddy bears and lollies and ice creams. We're not going to be like Washington where we have 99% dabbed concentrates advertised on billboards and with coupons available to anyone essentially with a pulse uh, who's over 21. We're not going to be like those crazy folks. We're going to do things in a very you know proper way, in a regulated way. The problem is, again, things easily open up because of money and politics over time. Regulation sounds like a good idea, this idea of yeah. creating the safe place to buy safe products. Yeah. The challenge, of course, is that the black market are simply not going to surrender their income so easily. Like I had young adult children and my son showed me just the other night. He said, Dad, look at the messages I get through social media from people I went to high school with who are yeah. offering to sell me drugs. Look at sure. the Snapchat picture of a table right. full of little bags of marijuana that are available for sale that will appear on his social media stream and disappear just as quickly. And he joked to me, he said, Dad, this young man who's trying to sell me has a marketing degree. He is yeah. absolutely engaging the skills he got from university right. to try and sell drugs on right. the side. The, the black market is, is changing and it's different from what we perhaps were expecting. It is. Listen, um, the underground market dealers don't, you know, go to dental school once you legalize drugs, okay? These people adapt they're able to say, oh, you're selling it to these people for this much? Well, then I'm gonna sell it to the younger people for that much. Or you only sell it at certain times because you have nice, beautiful regulations around it. Well, we're not gonna, we don't care about those regulations. We're gonna keep doing this. So listen, the black market hasn't been eliminated or even significantly reduced in any US state that I've seen or Canada. I mean, there's a thriving black market in Canada, especially for marijuana and even for cigarettes because they raise the price on it. So there's a very large black market for cigarettes as well, both in the US, but especially Canada. And 
so the idea is um, the idea is that we're not going to the drug dealers aren't going to go away just when you legalize and regulate. And by the way, you know, this idea of, well, at least we can get a safe substance. Um, there aren't, the, the reasons why people are going to the hospital today in New Zealand for cannabis, it's not because they're having laced cannabis. It's not because the dealers are lacing it with something. Uh, marijuana is cheap enough. They're, they don't, they're not lacing it with anything. They are, um, it's because of the harmfulness of marijuana. It's because of the potency and the fact that people are ingesting things that are much higher than they used to be. And I know that New Zealand is trying to put a cap on the potency. Um, first of all, the cap is very high. I mean, 50, if you're a naive user, especially unless you're a regular user, 14, 15% THC is very high. Number one, number two, that's a perfect invitation to a black market dealer to say, ah, I'm going to sell 20%, 25, 30, 50, 90, uh, and get away with it. So, um, you cannot regulate marijuana. This is the problem. It cannot be regulated properly. Whenever you try and do something, something else will pop up. It doesn't mean we have to throw people in prison. It doesn't mean we have to, you know, give up on folks. We should not do that. But we also shouldn't be normalizing and promoting something we know is harmful. Well, let's talk about this kind of false choice that appears to exist. This idea, on the one hand, we either throw people in jail, right. we have a legal market, and we promote health and right. education. But I notice on our TV screens, there are campaigns trying to target things like speeding and, and drink driving. These are still illegal. And yet we do have health and education campaigns for things that are still illegal. Is that a false choice? It is a false choice. Listen, we don't need to lock people up or legalize and normalize. We can educate, have prevention, treatment, get people help who, who need them. I think it's often set up as this boogeyman of prohibition. You know, if you don't do this, then we're going to have everybody come and lock you up in prison. You know, if you come and smoke a joint anywhere, um, that's not the reality. And so the reality is we can do better, have better laws rather than these two. I would say both are extremes on the one hand, heavy handed enforcement and all the problems that brings and not giving someone a second chance or giving them treatment. But on the other hand, um, the extreme of essentially mass normalization and commercialization. Well, talk to the person who says something like, hey, look, what I do in my home is my business. I'm not hurting anybody else. If I want sure. to smoke a joint, if I want to use cannabis, it's right. not hurting anybody. What yeah. Well, if it, even if we take that at face value, so if we take the fact that they don't have a family, they're not getting in a car, they're not late for work, they're not having a strain on the healthcare system, let's just take all that for granted and say they really are somewhere out in the woods and they're smoking a joint and falling asleep on a Friday night, they're hurting nobody. This referenda has nothing to do with them. I mean, you know, it's not about allowing people to sort of smoke a joint in the privacy of their own home. If that was the case, the wording of what, you all will be voting on would be very different. Um, and so the reality is this is about commercialization. This is about profits. This is about folks thinking that they can get some revenue from it, tax revenue, even, even though the revenue is always a drop in the bucket. It's never what you think it's going to be. And so uh, again, it's not really about that individual person sort of libertarian argument at all. I want to talk about one of the obvious sort of social outcomes where use kind of affects me, a member of the public, and that is when you get behind the wheel of a car. And there are two issues that I really want to understand a bit better. On the one hand, that it seems the police are saying there's no accurate impairment, roadside impairment test. They can't get you to blow into the breathalyzer and work out how high you are. And again, we have lots of users who are saying to me, I feel like I'm a better driver when I've had a smoke, yeah. the worst one. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that a lot. I mean, the reality is um, the research shows about a twofold increase, so a doubling in the risk of a car crash if you have a, even a small amount of THC in your system. It's not a huge amount. Uh, so we are seeing that. Uh, and there is no way to test impairment because marijuana affects people very differently from person to person. So it's very hard to have a cutoff number like we do for alcohol. Also, alcohol is absorbed um, quickly through your body within 24 hours, whereas THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, that absorbs, um, that can take much longer. It's absorbing in your fat, it's lipid. So it can be a week, it can be less, but it's never gonna be 24 hours usually, like alcohol is. And so it affects people very differently. The concentration of THC in your system doesn't necessarily correspond with how bad you're driving uh, because everyone is different. 
and naive users are different than heavy users. And there are all these considerations that come into play. So we don't have a way to accurately predict impairment right now. We might one day, but why would we legalize something that we don't even have the technology to protect people who are you know, innocent non-users? Um, the other way that we have to protect non-users, I think, is from the secondhand smoke issue. You know, it's taken basically Western civilization about a hundred years or more of pain and suffering at the hands of massive tobacco companies that sold what they wanted to, when they wanted to. In fact, I had a friend give me something. Uh, he found something in a magazine that was, uh, it was actually a magazine that also funded the marijuana movement in the eighties. And it was, I have to show you this, this right here. It's the camel cigarette uh, right here. And it's about, you know, you get your free camel t-shirt. This is from 1988. So it's, you know, it's not yesterday, but it's also not ancient history. Uh, and, um, you know, we learned the hard way, you know, it's a, in terms of what uh, these companies did and why we would want to repeat that. Um, to me, it doesn't make absolutely any sense. And so I worry about the secondhand smoke of non-users. I worry about that environmental smoke. Um, I worry about inhaling it through apartment buildings. That's a, become a very big issue in the United States um, is, is, is smelling marijuana because marijuana smoke is pungent and it travels far and fast. And uh, it's different actually than cigarette smoke in some ways. And so I worry about that because of the effects on your lung and heart. Uh, and so there are plenty of things that I think affect people who don't use it that get affected by multiple and more, more and more people using it. So imagine we're, we're sitting together in an airport lounge and the call for your flight suddenly comes over the loudspeaker system and the person turns to you and says, Kevin, it's been interesting to meet you. I've got to go, but tell me one thing that I need to know to make my decision on this referendum. What's the one thing they need to know? One thing they need to know is that marijuana is not as harmless as it's portrayed and that we should not be normalizing uh, a substance that the uh, basically the barons of pot, the ganjapreneurs are, are waiting to pounce on a new market. And you have to decide whether or not our kids and our children's future is worth that or not. That's a decision everyone's going to have to make.